Our chapter 2, Atoms and Elements. What might be helpful to have out and ready is also your periodic table, um, one provided for you to print offline on our Blackboard site. We can see that our chapter will uh, deal with the law of conservation of mass, how atoms are the basic building block of matter, and how they come together to form compounds, and eventually we start naming them. Learning chemistry is like learning a whole new language, both mathematically and in terms of the actual language. It starts with the story of the scientific revolution in the late 17th century. We talked about a scientific approach and really just to try to begin to understand how nature was established. For the next 150 some years, observations about nature were made that could not easily be explained without infidelity of matter. Here's what we're thinking. If you believe in the continuous theory of matter, let's just take a piece of paper. You could rip that in half, rip it in half again, rip that in half. Keep ripping and ripping and ripping until some point, at some point, do you create an indivisible block or forever and ever and ever can you always break that down a little bit further. That was the debate. The continuous theory of matter says for infinitely small pieces can be torn in half. There is no substance that can yet not be broken down further. It wasn't until about 1800s that we came up and really agreed upon the idea of an atom. And that atom literally means indivisible, the basic building block. And it was John Dalton who actually established that as our modern atomic theory in the 1800s. And it started with this basic law known as the conservation. Conservation means to conserve, means to keep the same. In an ordinary chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. That the total mass of the starting materials must equal the ending materials. We often use this in the lab when we say mass of reactants equal the mass of products. Antoine Lavoisier is given credit for saying the law of conservation. Notice a pretty strong term, the law. Many people were able to reproduce this, uh, these particular findings and thus became a law. So there is no destroying matter or creating matter, and that's true actually for energy as well. There's a law of conservation of energy. Looking at a typical reaction in a laboratory setting, we can see elemental sodium, Na, with its symbol solid, represents with the little s, the state of matter. Chlorine at room temperature is a gas. It's kind of a yellowish gas. It's commonly called mustard gas from World War II days, a very deadly poison. When sodium, as a solid, reacts with chlorine as a gas, we can clearly see a new compound forming completely different chemical and physical properties called sodium chloride, or table salt. The mass of the sodium, the reactant, added to the mass of chlorine, the reactant, does indeed match the mass of the solid table salt. So when atoms break bonds and form new bonds, the sum of their weight must be the same on both sides of our equation. For instance, 7.5 grams reacting with 11.9 grams, 19.6 grams of table salt was produced. When the mass of the sodium and the mass of the chlorine were indeed put together, even though atoms were rearranged to create new products, they did indeed form the same amount of product as we original reactants. Joseph Proust from 1754 to 1826, a famous chemist who also expanded on the law of conservation of mass to include the law of definite proportions. All samples of a given compound, regardless of their source or how they were prepared, have the same proportions of their constituent elements. If I think about a cup of water from Lake Michigan, a gallon of water from my faucet, no matter where the source, I'll come up with a consistent formula for water, two H's bonded to an O. So for instance, the proportions in the sodium chloride example we looked at on the screen before. If I took a hundred gram sample of sodium chloride, that's just ordinary table salt, and found the mass percentage, 
39.3 grams are coming from sodium. 60.7 grams are coming from chlorine. That's what we call a percentage part over whole. Out of a 100 gram sample, approximately 40-60 is the ratio. Take 200 grams of the sample. Notice the, lay, the uh, multiple of chlorine to sodium still comes out to be 1.54. We've just have twice as much sodium as compared to uh, and and as, as chlorine as well, but the ratio is consistent. The law of definite proportion. Taking one mole of sodium, fifty-eight point forty-four grams, simply shows the law again remaining true. Work this sample with me. Let's show that two samples of carbon dioxide do indeed obey the law of definite proportions. So carbon dioxide, hear those prefixes? CO2 is its chemical formula. Let's suppose in sample one, I have 25.6 grams of, carb of uh, oxygen, the first element, and 9.6 grams of carbon. From a different sample of carbon dioxide, I have 21.6 grams of O and 8.1 grams of C. We'd like to find, and again my head just thinks bigger over smaller, find that ratio of oxygen to carbon, proving the law of definite proportions. We know that all samples of a compound have the same proportion of elements by mass, so that the grams of oxygen compared to grams of carbon in each sample is what we're expected to find, the O to C ratio. We'll go to work. In sample one, place the mass of your oxygen over the mass of the carbon. Write down 25.6 grams divided by 9.60 grams and see that relationship coming out to 2.67. Hit that on your calculator to verify. Do the same for sample two. The mass of oxygen, that's the larger number, placed over the mass of carbon, the smaller number. We're finding the ratio of larger to smaller. And indeed it does prove 2.67. No matter where the sample, no matter where it comes from, the oxygen to carbon ratio does indeed prove to be consistent with the law of definite proportions. You try. Suppose we had 10 grams of calcite contains 4 grams of calcium. How much calcite contains 0.24 grams of calcium? We have a 10 gram sample of a, a form of calcium in pure form. Of the 10 grams, 4 is coming from calcium. That's 4 tenths or 40 percent if you wanted to think of it that way. How much calcite contains 0.24 grams of calcium? Think of this as a simple proportion. Given from our quantities what we were just told, we know one, some sample one, four grams of calcium in that 10 gram original sample. The sample two contained 0.24 grams of calcium. What we're looking for is how many grams of the calcite would contain that. So our conceptual plan, the grams of calcium from sample one, and we're going to need to know the grams of calcite from sample two. The ratio is always a definite proportion. Let's just simply set up what we know. Taking a peek at what we know compared to where we're heading. If 10 grams of our first sample contained 4 grams of calcite times the 0.24 grams from sample 2, notice what's happening with our units. The grams of calcium have canceled and we've converted. It really is nothing more than cross multiplying. 4 over 10 equal x over 0.24. And we find our answer, 0.6 grams of calcite.
pause and verify this with your own calculator that indeed we have proven the law of definite proportions. The law of multiple proportion comes to us from John Dalton, again the father of the modern atomic theory. John Dalton stated, when two elements, let's just call them A and B, form two different compounds, the mass of B that combines with one gram of A can always, always be expressed as a small whole number ratio. And I interpret this as saying when we write chemical formulas, there's no such thing as a fraction or a decimal for a subscript that atoms will always combine in whole number ratios. Sometimes in nature we have multiple ways certain elements can combine together. And we started with this one uh, in earlier chapter. We talked about carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. We have in our first diagram the, the darker element there, carbon combining with a single oxygen which is shaded in red. Carbon monoxide. In the other picture we see carbon dioxide. So a couple of different varieties of the elements have how C's and O's can bond. Carbon combines with oxygen to form two different compounds, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide contains 1.33 grams of oxygen for every one gram of carbon. Oxygen's a little heavier atom. However, carbon dioxide would contain twice as much oxygen for every gram of carbon. There are two atoms. Because there are twice as many O's bonded to the C, carbon dioxide should have a mass ratio of two. And we can verify that by thinking about that ratio. 2.67 set over 1.33 does indeed equal a whole number. Two. This shows that we've indeed obeyed the law of multiple proportions. Let's try one together, filling in this grid. Let's show that two oxides of nitrogen are consistent with the law of multiple proportions. What that's asking us to think about. Nitrogen, the symbol N, has a variety of ways it can form molecules with the other element, oxygen, whose symbol is O. In one molecule, nitrogen dioxide contains 2.28 grams of oxygen per gram of nitrogen. In a second sample, nitrogen to oxygen has a 2 to 1 ratio. Dinitrogen monoxide, 0.57 grams of O per gram of nitrogen. Let's find the oxygen and nitrogen dioxide and the O in dinitrogen monoxide. Now listen to those prefixes carefully. The first one, NO2, dinitrogen, or excuse me, nitrogen dioxide, NO2. The other one, dinitrogen monoxide, N2O. So that prefix di is letting us know how many of each element there are. Our conceptual plan with the relationships are now shown. If the samples of different compounds have the same elements, they show proportions by mass that are always, always small whole number ratios. Consider taking the larger number over the smaller number. The mass of oxygen in the first compound compared to the mass of oxygen in the second compound, larger over smaller, sets up a whole number of four. And because they have a small whole number ratio, we have indeed proven that it's obeying the law of multiple proportions. Larger over smaller will come out to be a whole number. Hematite contains 2.327 grams of iron per gram of oxygen. Woosite contains 3.490 grams of iron per gram of oxygen. Show these results are consistent with the law of multiple proportions. Again, larger over smaller showing a per gram of oxygen. We want to show that those two oxides of iron are consistent with the law of multiple proportions. What we know 
what we call the given, 2.327 grams of iron per gram of oxygen in our first compound, 3.490 grams of iron per gram of oxygen in our second compound. We'd like to prove the law of multiple proportions. We want to compare the ratio of one sample to the other. They have to work out to a small whole number ratio. With this particular example, placing larger over smaller, 3.490 over 2.327 comes out with a fraction of 1.5. Don't be alarmed, 1.5. We have a 1 to 1 and a half ratio. We do indeed, by multiplying both by 2, doubling gets rid of that fraction. 1 and a half doubled gives me 3. There's 3 to 2 ratio. Those are small whole numbers. So a 3 to 2 ratio still obeys the law of multiple proportions. So if I divide larger over smaller and I come out with a fraction of 0.5, double both and find the whole number. Other common fractions you might find, if I divide larger over smaller and it comes out to be 0.25, well that's 1 fourth. I'd multiply both by a 4 to get rid of the fraction. 0.333 repeating is the fraction of 1 third. I would multiply by 3 to get rid of the fraction. A very easy algebra trick to turn fractions into whole numbers. Trust me, you will not disprove the law of multiple proportions. They will always work out. This lays the foundation for Dalton's atomic theory. Dalton, the father of the modern atomic theory, proposed the following in his modern theory. He proposed that matter is made of basic building blocks we call atoms. These are indivisible particles and this helps to explain what now is the foundation of the atomic theory. We'll need to become very familiar with the four postulates of Dalton's atomic theory. Let's read through each one. Each element is composed of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. This to this day still holds true. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from atoms of other elements. In my head that just says atoms of one element are different from atoms of another element. Every element has a unique property and that is true. Atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form molecules of compounds. Well we've just shown that, the law of multiple proportions. Every time atoms combine, they do so in whole number ratios. We'll never have decimals or fractions for subscripts when we write chemical formulas. In a chemical reaction, atoms of one element cannot change into atoms of another element. They simply rearrange the way they are attached. The law of conservation of mass. I can't turn copper into gold. I can't turn silver into copper. Atoms retain their identity through ordinary chemical change. All we do is break bonds, rearrange them, and form new bonds. Let's decide if each statement is correct according to Dalton's model of an atom. If copper atoms combine with zinc atoms, we'll make gold. That seems silly. We cannot change the identity of an atom. That's my dog, Duke. Water is composed of many identical molecules that have one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms. Well, that's the law of definite proportion. It doesn't matter the source, molecules are identical. Water will always be two H's and an O. So that sentence is correct. It obeys the law of definite proportions. Some carbon atoms weigh more than other carbon atoms. Well, now that we understand isotopes, that actually is a true statement. Dalton did not understand that term, and we will understand. We have yet to define that term, but there are atoms of the same element that differ by the number of neutrons. Those are called isotopes. At the time, Dalton did not know about such things. Because the mass ratio of iron 
to oxygen in woosite is one and a half times larger than the iron to oxygen ratio in hematite, there must be one and a half iron atoms in a unit of woosite and one atom in a unit of hematite. And again, we say that's silly. There's no such thing as a fraction or a decimal place for a subscript. We now understand that a 1 to 1.5 ratio truly represents a 2 to 3 ratio, that they'll always, might I stress always, work out to a whole number ratio. So according to Dalton, all atoms of an element were identical. We now understand more about the term isotopes. According to Dalton, atoms must always combine in small whole number ratios. That was the law of multiple proportions. So that formula would have a 2 to 3 ratio, not a 1 to 1 1.5. Let's dive deeper into atoms and take some note on charges. There's two types of charges, a positive and a negative, and here's just some basic laws of electricity. Two kinds of charge are called positive and negative, and in, in an atom we understand positive charges come from protons, negative charges come from electrons, and really the, the whole idea of how atoms bond together, stay together, all comes down to some basic laws of electricity. Positive, indicated in red, and negative, which are indicated in yellow, are opposite electrical charges, and there's a very strong attraction. It's called an electrostatic attraction between opposite charges. Opposite charges attract, and like charges repel. The two positives repel. The two negatives repel. To be neutral, a net charge of zero, we need one positive charge to neutralize one negative charge to give a sum of zero. A net charge of zero when one positive is neutralized by one negative. This slide just shows the basic laws of electricity, but very important understanding how atoms come together to form compounds. This is a slide of an early chemical experiment using something called a cathode ray tube. Now a cathode ray tube is commonly found in old computer monitors, well old TVs. These flat screens don't have CRTs any longer. They're, they're using liquid crystal display or perhaps a plasma. But in the old days with the larger sets they used a cathode ray tube which is an evacuated glass tube with some electrodes on each end. So there's no air, that's what evacuated means. And when it's put to a high energy source, we start to create a positive end called an anode and a negative end called a cathode. Maybe cathode and anode are familiar terms from a battery terminal. And you flip the switch on and we create this energy ray known as a cathode ray. And we can begin manipulating the behavior of that ray with a magnet. We can get it to bend. J.J. Thompson experimented with CRTs, cathode ray tubes. He believed that those rays were actually particles, and those particles were carrying charges. He used electromagnets to bend these charges to decide if they were positive or negative. He designed an experiment that demonstrated that they were particles, and he measured the amount of force it took to deflect the path during a given amount of time. So it's like measuring the amount of force needed to make a car turn a corner, a very important uh, aerodynamic property. We began to investigate placing a field around this cathode ray tube. Cathode end of the terminal, negative, see the power supply matching, and a positive cathode ray tube end, the anode. And he put a field around it. That's what the brown lines are representing is, is um, an electrical field. Charge matter is attracted to this field, however a light, which you would argue is pure energy, although a photon they say is a particle, is not deflected by an electrical field. And we started to create this field being um, going across the cathode ray tube, and notice we start to see positive and negative charges starting to develop, and we can actually bend this cathode ray. As the cathode ray begins to bend towards the positive, remember the basic laws of electricity? Well, that particle must be negative because opposites attract. 
And he even started to talk about the charge on this thing he called an electron, negatively charged. And again, this is in a field where a magnet going around this um, electron beam can use to deflect and actually create certain pathways, predictable pathways of the electron coming out of a cathode ray tube. Thomson's results with cathode rays gave really a historical foundation to the particles inside of atoms. They're made of particles. We didn't know. We thought atoms were basic, indivisible, cannot be divided down. But this proved there's smaller things inside of atoms. And they have negatively charged particles. The amount of deflection was related to two factors, a charge to mass ratio. And this lays the foundation of an, a basic electrical unit known as a coulomb. The charge to mass ratio of a, the simplest atom of all of hydrogen, 9.58 times 10 to the fourth. That's four zero, so it's a large number, coulombs per gram. Again, kind of a nice to know number. It's not an important one to memorize, but realizing that the conclusions began to lay the foundation that atoms themselves were based up of smaller particles. That particle must be at least 2,000 times smaller than the smallest atom of hydrogen. And scientists picked up there. Millikan started to do an oil drop experiment. And atoms themselves are not unbreakable, but they are made of smaller particles. And if one's negative, we must have one that's positive, because themselves, atoms are indeed neutral. This represents a slide of oil's Millik or Millikan's oil drop experiment. Again, determining the charge, uh, you know, to mass ratio. And this is an experiment. It's kind of a, an ingenious thing, an atomizer, just kind of an aerosol back in the day that created. Um, it literally was oil droplets he sprayed into this container. He had a negatively charged plate at the bottom, an ionizing radiation force. Then he had an, uh, a microscopic uh, kind of a view chamber there. Positive charge on the top, negative charge at the bottom, and zapped him to see which direction they would go. Alrighty. And all this really did for scientists was to verify, and that's the important thing if we're going to come up with, with a, a theory or a law that's accepted by the scientific community, we must verify in multiple different ways by multiple different scientists. And that's really the early days of the atomic theory. It was a very exciting time for scientists. These Thompson believed that these particles were ultimately the building blocks of matter. And here's a quote. We have in the cathode rays matter in a new state, a state in which the subdivision of matter is carried very much further, a state in which all matter is one kind and the same kind, this matter being the substance from which all chemical elements are built. These became known as electrons. It didn't matter the identity of the atom. All atoms had electrons. And all electrons, no matter their source, were charged. And they even determined how tiny that charge would be. <clears throat> 1.6 times 10 to the 9th tone coulombs per 9.1 times 10 to the negative 28th gram. Electrons are negatively charged particle. The series of cathode ray experiments and the oil drop helped determine that by Millikan. Because the atom is no longer divisible, Thompson must propose a new model over Dalton's atomic theory. I remember Dalton, such a good solid foundation, but he did not know of the smaller particles. If I close my eyes and imagine a Dalton atom, it's like a solid marble. Nothing inside of it, just a marble. And that marble might represent a hydrogen atom because it's small. A bowling ball might represent a carbon atom. It's much larger, different color to it, different size to it, and yet nothing smaller inside. But now we're, we're beginning to modify that. Thompson proposed that instead of being a hard, marble-like, unbreakable sphere, that atoms actually had an inner structure. Thinking about a chocolate chip cookie comes to mind, although he was an Englishman, so he had plum pudding 
the structure contains these negatively charged electrons randomly dispersed through like this positive dough, if I'm thinking chocolate chip cookie, or a pl like raisins in a plum pudding model. I can picture um, bread pudding that has raisins in it. Um, or chocolate chip cookie just is an easier visual than plum pudding for me. But the idea here is that we have these randomly dispersed electrons inside of this positive dough-like region. Absolutely no idea of a nucleus yet. But that had to be some sort of positive charge to keep the electrons uh, balanced electrically. So the plum pudding model says the mass of the atom is due to the mass of the electrons within it. Electrons are the only particles in a plum pudding model, so it's the only source of mass. So not true today. The atom is mostly empty space. That's true. Should not have a bunch of negatively charged particles near each other, so they had to have some sort of way of dispersing, and that was kind of this positive dough-like region. We began to play with radioactivity through the story of the atom. And Madame Curie, Marie Curie, who has many different elements uh, named after her. From her native uh, Poland, we have polonium. There's the element curium. Her husband, Pierre, also a famous chemist. Marie Curie is one of the um, only famous female chemists to make the periodic table. Late 1800s, Henri Bacquerel and Marie Curie discovered certain elements constantly emitted small energetic particles we now know as radiation and, and it actually killed her based on uh, the amount of exposure was her um, her laboratory exposed her to many different types of radiation and she died a, a, much too early in her life Rutherford discovered that there were three different kinds of emissions, alpha, beta, and gamma rays. It will make mention in this course, but it's not till Chem 3 that we actually take a nuclear uh, unit and kind of dissect what those terms actually mean and how to calculate. Alpha, beta, and gamma rays are the types of nuclear emissions coming out when an atom is radioactive. How can you prove something is mostly empty space was Rutherford's challenge. Thompson proposed this chocolate chip cookie model or the plum pudding model and said an atom's mostly empty space, just randomly dispersed electrons where all of the mass is coming from. Well, Rutherford went to work to kind of prove something else. He started to create a um, target, if you will, very Thin sheets, he used actual thin sheets of gold, because gold is a large atom, can be hammered into a pretty thin sheet. And he used a very small bullet, he used an alpha particle, which is the helium nuclei. So a gold um, target made of helium nuclei bullets, and he started to shoot these bullets through a thin piece of gold. And lo and behold, what he was trying to prove actually came to fruition the vast majority of the alpha particles that he's shooting at that gold foil went through the gold foil as if it weren't there. Atoms are mostly empty space. Now remember, helium nuclei, very tiny but very dense. To hit the gold foil, he proposed they would deflect, but the vast majority passed straight through and hit this is just a radioactive film kind of in a circle around that gold foil to detect where the radiation hit. Notice that sometimes they got deflected as if something were there changing its pathway. And this was very intriguing for Rutherford. As Rutherford tried to explain what he was seeing. Again, vast majority went straight through, but once in a while, about 2% of the time, the alpha particles were deflected at very large, large angles, so much so that it couldn't be explained by saying an atom is mostly empty space. It's as if you fired a 15-inch cannon shell at a piece of tissue paper, and it came back and hit you. How do you explain those results? Well, if 98% of the time bullets go straight through, we do agree an atom is mostly empty space. But how to explain the deflection? And this is where the development of a dense nucleus was born.
Rutherford then proposed that atoms must also contain a very dense, very, very tiny, small region he called a nucleus. And that nucleus must be positive. If I'm shooting positive bullets and I come near a positive core, there's the deflection. Like charges repel. So as these bullets made of positive nuclei from helium came close to a gold nuclei who also contain positive regions, like charges repel and you saw the bullet deflect. So we've taken a next step in our atomic theory. We started with the plum pudding model. J.J. Thompson, I call it chocolate chip cookie. He proposed, Thompson's model said, if an atom was like a plum pudding, all of the alpha particles should go straight through as if it weren't there at all. Every single bullet would hit straight through on that radioactive um, detection paper. But once in a while, once in a great while, 2% of the time, Rutherford saw the path deflected. Almost all go straight through, but if you see that line deflect, some alpha particles going through, coming close, get deflecting. Some come straight back at you if it hits dead on. This provided the scientific community with enough evidence to say there's a nucleus. There has to be this dense, tiny center Rutherford named the nucleus. It is by far the most massive region of the atom, but it is by far the tiniest, tiniest space compared to the size of the atom. Electrons by far take up the most region, but they're mostly empty space. Those are what we now call electron clouds. The nucleus is essentially the entire mass of the atom. And those electrons just weigh so little they give practically no mass to the atom at all. Now that's the opposite of what Thompson had proposed. Here's a good analogy. If I have a dog and I go to the vet and I, I put my dog up on the scale. If the dog has fleas, does that change the weight of the dog? A flea has mass, but significantly does it contribute to the weight of the dog? That analogy parallels, <laughs> that's the phone, I'm going to ignore it. That analogy parallels my electron to the mass of an atom. An electron has mass, but compared to the weight of an atom, it's insignificant. So the electrons contribute no mass to an atom. The nucleus is positively charged. It must be because it had to balance the negatively charged electrons. We know there's negative particles. The cathode ray and the Millikan oil drop experiment proved so. There must be a positive core we now know as the nucleus. And there are electrons, no arrangement to them yet. Those electrons were just randomly dispersed. So the structure of the nucleus, Rutherford proposed that the nucleus had a particle that had the same amount of charge as an electron, but of the opposite sign. He called them protons, electrons negative, protons positive. Protons are subatomic particles found in the nucleus with a positive charge and a heavier mass than an electron. We know that since atoms are neutral, neutral atoms must have the same number of protons as electrons. Atoms are indeed neutral. If I compare the relative mass and charge, it's sometimes easier to think of things rather than the outside standard. When you do this, it's a scale of comparison called a relative scale. If we generally talk about the size of charge on atoms by comparing it to the amount of charge on an electron, we call it a negative one charge. That's easier to think of than saying, you know, the previous number that had an exponent with it to a negative power. We're going to say electrons are negative one, protons are positive one, knowing that it's a comparison of the charge from one to another. We'll say a proton has a mass of one. One what? 
one atomic mass unit. It's a comparison to the size of a carbon atom. Everything's based on the carbon atom. So when we say hydrogen weighs one, one twelfth that of a carbon atom, which is given the unit of an AMU, atomic mass unit. We have some problems or some holes in our theory. Some problems that would include how to explain atoms sticking together. If I'm placing positive protons inside of a nucleus and it's such a tiny, tiny area, how do they stick together? What, what prevents them from just exploding apart or repelling? Like charges repel. And another observation, if beryllium, BE is its symbol, it's number four on your periodic table. If it has four protons, shouldn't it weigh four AMUs, atomic mass units? It should be one-third the size of a carbon atom that weighs 12. But these are observations that were not happening. Beryllium actually weighs nine AMUs. Where's the extra mass coming from? If one proton contributes one atomic mass unit, where are the other four coming from, or five? So we begin to consider a second particle in the nucleus that's contributing mass but not charge. And that's when we came up with the neutron. The neutron serves to add weight and to help separate the protons from one another to alleviate the like charges repelling one another. Neutrons essentially weigh the same as a proton, essentially, but they have no net charge. They are neutral. This helps explain why positive protons can pack into a, into a nucleus, because they're separated by the neutrons. And it helps to explain the mass of the atoms themselves. If I compare the mass of a proton to the mass of a neutron, they are essentially the same. An electron is insignificant in weight. We say it's mostly zero. Mass of a proton and neutron contribute to the weight of the atom. They both live in the nucleus. The electron is mostly empty space and resides outside. The proton charge of plus one, the electron charge of minus one, and a neutron charge of zero. When I write the symbol for a proton, you'll see me write it as the center example, P with a positive. When I write the symbol for an electron, I write that as E negative. And when I write the symbol for neutron, I write that as N with a zero, no charge. Those symbols allow us to reinforce the fact that they are indeed charged particles, negative one, positive one, or zero. So why does matter appear continuous if the atom is mostly empty space? We got to talk about some arrangement to those electrons yet. So the story keeps evolving. Got a great handle on the nucleus. It's ta time to tackle electron arrangement. We understand that emptiness of an atom on such a small scale that the variations in density cannot be seen. But our macroscopic observations of all particles colliding so much larger than this scale that the particles appear to be solid instead of mostly empty space. This lays the foundation for what's called the quantum mechanical model. Again, that'll be a further chapter down the road when we start to discover how electrons arrange themselves into certain shaped clouds, spherical shaped clouds, hourglass shaped clouds and so forth. Each element has a unique number of protons in its nucleus. This is known as the atomic number. Every element has a unique number of protons known as its atomic number. Atomic numbers give the element its identity. Because each element has a unique atomic number, each element has a unique name, and each element has a unique symbol. Each symbol is denoted by one or most have two letters, very specific to that element. It's a shorthand for naming elements. We'll begin to memorize the symbols. We just do because we use them so often.
When we write symbols for elements, the first one is always a capital letter, and the second one must be a lowercase letter. Elements have symbols to denote their names. The number of protons define the element. Helium, for example, has two positive protons. It's the only element that has two protons. It is found in balloons if I'm, I'm filling up a helium balloon. Carbon has six positive protons. It is number six on the periodic table. Carbon's most abundant form is graphite, we see in a pencil lead. The number of protons gives the atom its identity. Every element is placed on the periodic table according to its atomic number. And just as we read a sentence from left to right, we read the periodic table from left to right. Hydrogen 1, beryllium 2, or excuse me, helium 2, lithium 3, beryllium 4, boron 5, all the way through left to right. The atomic number gives the atom its identity. You'll also see this chemical symbol and the name. What's missing from this particular table are the mass numbers, how heavy the atom is. The periodic table, oh, look at the arrangement here, showing us metals, nonmetals, the metalloids, um, different properties based on the arrangement of where they're found. Notice some symbols are one letter, like carbon, capital C, S, sulfur, capital S, I for iodine, capital I, but most actually involve two letters, where the second one is lowercase. B, small r, is bromine. S, small r, is strontium. Capital B, boron, capital S, sulfur. Very important if you see a second letter, it's designating a completely different element. Most symbols come from the element's name. C stands for carbon, but there's a lot of elements that don't make sense to us because they're coming from Latin names. AU is the symbol for gold, aurum. CU is the symbol for copper, cuprium. NA is the symbol for sodium. We can see many different examples where the letter has nothing to do with the name. SN for tin, PB for lead, and so forth. We become more and more familiar with the names and the symbols of elements as we use them. There'll never be a time where I make you memorize all the names and the symbols. You will always, always have access to your periodic table. But what happens is just eventually, from the ones that you use so often, you begin to remember. Let's talk more about the structure of the nucleus. Sadi discovered that the same element could have atoms with different masses. He labeled those as isotopes, I-S-O-T-O-P-E-S, -E isotopes. They are identical atoms that differ by the number of neutrons. They weigh different, same protons, same electrons, different neutrons. For instance, there are two isotopes of chlorine found in nature. One weighs 35 atomic mass units, the other weighs 37 atomic mass units. They are identical elements, if it's chlorine, it must be number 17, 17 protons. But they have differing neutrons, making them weigh differently. The observed mass on a periodic table is a weighted average of the weights of all the naturally occurring atoms. We come up with what's known as its natural abundance. If I look on our periodic table and find the weighted average for chlorine printed on our table, 35.45 AMUs, gives us an indication about the relative abundance of the two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Since its average is much closer to the number 35 than to the number 37, I could easily predict that chlorine 35 is more abundant in nature.
The two isotopes weighted average is what lands on the periodic table. Those are known as their atomic masses. All isotopes of an element are chemically identical in every way. They'll behave the same in chemical reactions. Remember, protons give the atom its identity. Neutrons can vary without changing its chemical behavior. All isotopes of an element have the same number of protons. If it didn't, it wouldn't be the same element. Isotopes of elements have different masses. Isotopes of an element have differing numbers of neutrons. Isotopes are identified by their mass numbers, which is the sum of their protons and neutrons. Protons, when added to neutrons, always gives a whole number, and that gives us the identity of the isotope. Let's clarify some of these vocabulary words further. An atomic number, the whole number on our periodic table as we read from left to right, hydrogen 1, helium 2, lithium 3, and so forth. The Z is the symbol given for the atomic number, automatically telling us the number of protons. A mass number is always a whole number. It's found by adding all of the protons and neutrons found in the nucleus for that particular isotope. The mass number has a symbol A. The abundance of an isotope is the relative amount found in a sample. We talked about the relative abundance of the two isotopes of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. When I average all of the isotopes together, that's called the atomic mass. And that abundance plays a role in that. And that's what lands on a periodic table. That's why we see decimal points on the periodic table. It's the weighted average of all of the isotopes for that element. A single atom will always have a whole number for a weight. A whole bunch of atoms weighed together gives us an average weight of all of the isotopes present in that sample, and that will often have a decimal point, and that weighted average appears on the periodic table. Notice the three isotopes of neon on this slide. Neon, the first isotope with a symbol of 20. Find neon on your periodic table. It's number 10. Neon has 10 protons. It's atomic symbol Ne. It has an atomic number of 10. 20 minus 10 tells me 10 neutrons. Remember the sum of the protons and neutrons gives me the mass number. It's relative abundance, about 90.5 percent abundant in nature. Another rare isotope is neon 21. 21 over 10 indicates still 10 protons, but I've added one more neutron to make that go up by one for the mass number. 9.25 percent abundant is a neon 22 isotope. Again, same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Let's try one here. Here's a symbol of an element, CR. CR stands for chromium. Chromium is number 24 on your periodic table. The symbol 52 over 24 represents what's called the standard isotopic notation. The standard isotopic notation. CR the symbol. To the left of that symbol, raised high, is its mass number set over the smaller 24, its atomic number. Mass number set over atomic number set next to the symbol, the standard isotopic notation. That's all we need to calculate how many protons, how many electrons, and how many neutrons are in this isotope. We're being asked to calculate or to solve for how many protons, electrons, and neutrons. We understand that the symbol CR stands for chromium. Its atomic number, by the very definition, tells us protons. And since atoms are indeed neutral, proton number 
and electron number must indeed be equal. Atoms are neutral. The atomic number and the mass number can be used to solve for the neutrons, knowing that the sum of the two pieces gives us the whole weight of the nucleus. So as soon as we see chromium's number 24, we now know there's 24 protons, 24 electrons. I'm going to subtract 52 minus 24. 52 minus 24 tells us the missing number of neutrons that are contributing to the weight. This particular isotope of chromium has 28 neutrons. For most stable isotopes, the neutrons, and again, the, the larger the atom, this statement becomes more and more true. The smaller the atom, you're going to find that they actually come out pretty close to the same number as more stable arrangement. So the neutron number in this particular isotope of chromium is greater than the number of protons. Atomic number gives us its identity. The mass number gives us the weight of neutrons and protons. Since protons and electrons are indeed the same, atoms are neutral. Take a moment. Fill this grid in. Use your periodic table. Practice the skill. Protons, number six, tells us the atom's identity. Immediately go to number six on your periodic table. You're going to see that that's carbon. It has a symbol C. Immediately, protons number six tells you that it's six electrons. They must be the same. Immediately, knowing proton number six, it's its atomic number. And I will sum six plus seven to place 13 in its mass number. Boy, that does not match the periodic table. Periodic table, if you find carbon, it will have stamped 12.011. That's a different isotope. The most relative abundant isotope is carbon 12. This happens to be carbon 13. If you look at number 42 on your periodic table, find number 42, record its symbol. You now know its atomic number, and you now know its proton number. Protons, electrons, atomic number, all the same. 96 minus 42 now tell you the neutrons. Aluminum, 27 over 13. 27 minus 13 tell us 14 neutrons. The weight of the atom, 27. By the way, M-O, you pronounce that molybdenum. That's a tough one to sound out, molybdenum. And the last row I want you to check, cesium. C-S stands for cesium. It's number 55 on our periodic table. 55 protons, 55 electrons. 133 minus 55 give us the number of neutrons as 78. Let's pause here. I'm going to start up again in just a moment.